This is Your Superior Self, episode 49. It's okay to ask for help. And you have to become a master delegator. Like you, you have to get the three things you have to get right. Systems, processes, and team delegation. And if you nail those three things and you're strict with your time, and it's not easy to nail those things, by the way. You've got there's a lot of things that you've got to get right there. But you become the conductor of the orchestra. You're not the person playing all the instruments. So if you're still playing any of the instruments, you need to stop doing that because you need to teach someone else how to play it. And then you've got to be the, the conductor, the leader, and learn to lead. And that is something I didn't know that I was good at until I stepped out of corporate. And I realized that so many things I learned in my corporate career that seemed like second nature to me. Other people didn't really know how to do this, particularly in the entrepreneurial world. You know, all those like meeting rhythms and agendas and milestones and deadlines and how to run projects and things like that. I was able to actually do that and to lead that sort of thing. And I was, you have to become 100% committed to that. What is up, Superior Nation? Welcome back to your favorite podcast, Your Superior Self. I am Trey Downs blue collar worker turned into blue collar entrepreneur and I get to discuss my favorite subject today which is entrepreneurship which has the power to change the world and positively impact billions of people even though it seems overwhelming and sometimes chaotic I love it and today to talk about entrepreneurship I have Barbara Turley CEO of the virtual hub on her story is incredible and I, I'm excited to have her on the show but before I dive into the interview with her I wanted to read from the book Resisting Happiness by Matthew Kelly it's the book that inspired me to be a better version of myself it's the one that helped me realize that there is daily resistance out there that is trying to knock you down on your path to self-growth and and one form of daily resistance is loneliness which all of us can relate to as an entrepreneur. And in his book, Matthew Kelly says, the loneliness of course served a purpose. It is a great teacher. It's a form of pain and pain can be a ruthless teacher. You put your hand on a hot stove and you learn not to do that again. But that can be a brutal lesson. Loneliness is not brutal like that, but it can be a painful way to learn. Interestingly, solitude is the cure for loneliness. When we are afraid of being alone, we should go into it dive deep into it. Solitude teaches profound lessons, especially about ourselves. Feeling lonely has value. Sometimes we need to turn inward to discover what we need to hold on to and what we need to let go of. The loneliest journey is that of an entrepreneur because not everyone understands our mission in life. Not everyone understands what inspires us. And when we start following our dreams and when we start taking the path that is less traveled by others, we get rejected. You get rejected because it makes others uncomfortable. And that's okay. You're, you're going to be by yourself because it's your dream. It's no one else's but yours. And you're going to encounter trials and tribulations to reach that dream. You're going to encounter problems that you're going to have to solve. And all that does is make you better. It is the next step in your game of life that is going to to get you closer to your dreams. And I'm kind of guilty of self-inflicted loneliness because I merge myself into my work, merge myself into my passions so much that I tend to isolate myself from others because I'm just so passionate about the work. And then when I come out of it or I, I lift my head for air, there's no one around. And I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I think loneliness is a can be a tool because you get more things done but others struggle with it because they feel like there's no one there to support them and my idea behind that is that they don't understand you their your ideas your dreams are going to make them uncomfortable because it's not theirs they're not used to those types of ideas and what you need to do is submerge yourself in the loneliness that is where you're going to get the work done that's where you're going to find out what really and truly motivates you don't be afraid of the loneliness. Merge yourself into it and find out who you truly are. Stop listening to the crowd. Stop listening to the masses and listen to your heart and what it's telling you. And what my heart is telling me to do right now is show some gratitude. So I want to say thank you to you, the listener. 
Thank you for hanging out with me today, taking time out of your busy schedule to listen to what I have to say. If this is the first time you've listened to the podcast, please hit subscribe and leave a rating and a review wherever you get your podcasts from. And I want to recognize all the volunteers out there, whether you're volunteering at the local shelter or you're volunteering in your kids' local youth programs. You guys are giving something that you can never get back, and that's your time. And I want to say thank you for that. And to get back to our amazing guest today on the show, I have for you Barbara Turley. She's an investor and entrepreneur with a keen interest in scalable business models. During her 15-year financial markets career, she was a trader for some of the world's largest investment banks. She successfully traded her own money and managed relationships with some of Australia's largest wealth management businesses and became an early stage investor in a number of very successful disruptive financial services companies. Today, Barbara is an investor, entrepreneur, and founder of The Virtual Hub, a business that she started by accident that exploded in a span of 12 months. It became one of the leading companies that recruits, trains, and manages virtual assistants. She's also the founder of Energize Wealth, an online platform for ambitious women who want to create wealth and impact from whatever stage they are in their wealth journey. This is such a powerful interview and I can't wait for you guys to listen. So without further ado, here is Barbara Turley. Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Your Superior Self. Tonight, I am joined by Barbara Turley. She's an investor, entrepreneur, and founder and CEO of The Virtual Hub. Barbara, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Trey. Delighted to be here. So why don't you go ahead and give us a quick rundown about what you're doing today? Sure. So today, I run, as I was saying to you off air, like a crazy ship called the Virtual Hub, which is a company in the Philippines. And we recruit, train, and manage virtual assistants in the mainly in the digital marketing and social media kind of management space for businesses all over the world that are looking to kind of scale their uh, the, the endless to-do lists that come with anything to do with digital marketing and implementation. So we have 100 staff on the ground, 100 employees now on the ground in the Philippines, which is a bit of a milestone. Uh, but like I said, crazy ship when you run that many people. Yeah, absolutely. So talk about your investing years. So like I asked you before, was that in securities or uh, VCs? And you had mentioned to me that it was angel investing. Like explain that experience. Sure. So just, just to look, my background, I did spend 15 years in the financial industry, but the first 10 years of that were actually on the trading floors. So actually it was in equity trading. So in that fast, furious, dynamic, changing world of trading floors, which I absolutely loved and I learned a lot about, you know, how companies develop, you know, how companies fail, I guess, in that arena as well. Um, and then after that, you know, to cut a long story short, the um, uh, financial crisis changed a lot of things many years ago, the, the big global financial rumble that happened in 20, 2008. Um, and I moved after that into asset management sales, uh, which was a different kind of a role for me. And it was a different end of the in industry. Um, and from that, I got an opportunity actually to get involved in a management buyout of a business from Deutsche Bank here in Australia um, with a group of other people. And it was my first kind of chance to to try something new and, and to actually take some risk um, and invest in something, which I did. Um and I'm still an investor in that in that business. It's 10 years later now. It's been very successful. But from that, it kind of started a journey of meeting very interesting people doing interesting other startups. And I, I got involved in a couple of those along the way. So it was very much sort of accidental uh, and just taking my opportunities when they when they came my way, really. So when people find out you're an investor, do they start pitching you right away? How does that work? Like, what's that intro like? <laughs> It's funny, actually. I think um, the word investor is like the word money. It just it carries so much weight for so many people that they almost don't know what to say. And they think it's like this kind of voodoo world that other people inhabit. And it's really not like that at all. Um, a couple of people have tried to pitch me, but I'm very clear that, look, I'm not like I'm an angel investor, but I'm very specific about the types of things that I would invest in. Predominantly, it's in the financial services space because I, I completely understand that space. And it's usually technology driven because I have a real um, interest in the tech space myself. But I, I think people get a bit taken aback because they there's not many people, particularly women, who who do it. 
I don't know about in America, but in the rest of the world, it's kind of a weird thing for females to do. It's growing, but uh, yeah, I've been doing it for a long time. Well, what's the difference between angel investor and uh, VC? Sure. So angel investing is very much in the very early stages. So it's like a seed kind of thing. Often the angel investors will be like your family, your friends, you know, the first couple of hundred grand that you raise from, you know, beg, borrow and steal to try and get the business off the ground, you know. Um, venture capital funding then comes a little bit later when it's more, you know, there is probably uh, at least an established idea. You're going to be approaching investors. They're going to be doing massive due diligence on you. Um, and it's a much more formalized kind of approach. Uh, you know, there can be a sort of a line between where they blur, but generally Angel is much earlier in the very, very risky stages. What's the best pitch that you've ever heard? I haven't heard that many pitches, would you believe? Uh, really? Yeah, I don't get I, I don't go to pitches and I don't go out looking for pitches. Usually um, the things I've invested in a handful of, of startups. So when I say a handful, I literally mean four to five. And typically there are people I met along the way by accident who weren't pitching at me or never didn't think that I was going to be an investor. And I was like, so, you know, what are you guys doing? And then I was like, okay, that sounds really interesting to me. Are you raising capital? And that question has brought out the, yes, actually we are. Uh, but I haven't, um, I, the first investment I got involved in the management buyout thing was probably the, the very early stage thing. Post that, I was more getting involved in companies that were um, moving towards that VC stage, but I just got in just before that. So, you know, it's kind of in that gray area, a bit more lucky break type stuff. Well, did any of the investments that you uh, participated in, did they ever present to you like a business plan or was it just, con like you said, was it just a conversation? Because I know a lot of people now that are, yeah, I'm definitely in that process where we're starting to write a business plan and I'm learning about angel investors and venture venture capitalist like what is it that catches your eye is it the business plan or is it the pitch okay so here's a really interesting one yeah now full caveat here i was a trader for 10 years right i'm used to making very fast decisions and seeing opportunities quickly right you learn that on the trading floor but i've always said this to people look you could, business plans are great right of course you want to see that you want to see some solid you know kind of ideas you want to see the structure but I am big into, I just know if it's a person I want to back or not. So the man, the people running it, are you going to back them, right, or not? Because the best business plan in the world run by a terrible team will fail. That's, that's basically it. So you can look at business plans, but you've got to have that kind of moment of that energetic feeling of going, I'm going to back this person. This person is going to succeed. This person is going to take this one home. And that's really the crucial point. I love that because it's more about the person than it is actually yeah. the piece of paper that you're handing over saying, hey, look, in a year, two years, I'll be uh, profitable. Um, I, I like that yeah. a lot. That's how do you I mean, how do you get good at that, though? Like, how do you read someone and say, hey, look, I, I think you're going to be successful. Is it something that they say? Is it how they carry themselves? Yeah, because you got to I was just thinking as you were talking, going, oh, I've got to be careful that, you know, people listening don't get sold because there's obviously like the great salespeople out there. So. Um, it's a very hard question to answer and I don't mean to be vague. It's, it's more like, uh, I remember when I first was a junior trader in my very early career and I just couldn't understand how the traders in the room would see them. They would say to me, do you see the market turning? Do you see it turning? And I'd be like, no, I don't see anything. I just, I don't know. I just see all these trades going through. And the head of trading at the time said to me, I'll never forget this. He said, watch the flow watch the, the, the volume changing, the composition changing. And over time and experience, I learned to, it's like you can feel it on your fingertips. Now, that doesn't make it easier for, for your listeners to understand how. I just mean that sometimes um, there is risk involved in all um, investing. So the trick is that you've got to start small. If you are thinking about this, you've got to dip your toe. You've got to be very uh, you've got to hone your intuition around people and then you've got to not invest too much of your, don't put all your eggs in one basket, see how it goes. And hopefully, you know, you back a couple of winners. It's, it's a little bit like gambling in some ways. Mm -hmm. Now, is that a thrill for you? Do you, I mean, are you, when you invest, do you, are you a hands-on or do you kind of sit back and just kind of watch? I sit back. 
generally. I've no interest in being involved. I, I run my own company. I'm like, oh my God, I'm too busy doing that. Um, I think as well, I've also invested with people who have extreme experience in the thing that they're doing. So, you know, it's not just knowing that they have the right, uh, you know, people who are magnetic. They just, you know, you know, they're going to be winners. They're like that. But they also have the experience. They've got, uh, they've either done this before, they've been involved in other startups, or they have a background in the industry they're going into. That can be a good thing. But it's not necessarily the, you know, who knows, the little thing that makes one person successful over another. So talk about the virtual hub. Um, I know that you run a, a team of, I think you call it uh, angel, uh, what is it? What What is it? It's virtual <laughs> angels or something like that? Yeah. Well, look, so the, the company is now called the virtual hub. But in the early days, I actually called it virtual angel hub. And the reason I called it that is because I was like, they were like virtual assistants in the Philippines for me were like angels that flew down from heaven and like took all my to-do lists off me and lifted my overwhelm off me so I could actually move faster and get things done. A couple of years later, I found that the word angel was, oh, it was becoming problematic in lots of ways and we rebranded. So we rebranded to the virtual hub, which is more of a neutral style brand because obviously we've got a lot of male clients, we've got a lot of male VAs and all that sort of thing. So yeah, but they are like angels sent from heaven sometimes. So, so talk about that. What is a virtual assistant? Sure. So a virtual assistant, and actually this is a great question because people often mix up virtual assistants with strategists. <laughs> like that sounds crazy, but people think they're going to get more than what they will with an assistant. The problem with the word virtual assistant is it's very broad. It can mean anyone from like someone with a heartbeat that can type to someone who can build a website and code an app, right? And all of a sudden, everyone thinks these are all virtual assistants. There are um, generalist virtual assistants, and then there are very specialized ones that are coders and developers, and they're not virtual assistants, really. They're just, you know, they're specialists. So in the purest sense of the word, virtual assistant is someone who is going to come in and assist you to execute the processes and the systems that you have built and that you're going to train that person on. They are an assistant. And that is really... It's a crucial thing to get right because I see businesses all the time hiring a virtual assistant and as someone put it to me, throwing a, bo- throwing a body at the problem. So the problem is you're overwhelmed and your answer is to throw a body at the problem. That doesn't help at all. You've got to build your processes, your systems, and then you've got to bring someone in and teach them how to run your systems and processes in your business for you. That's a virtual So. Uh, so I run a podcast. What would a virtual assistant do for me? Yeah, perfect one. Because I also run a podcast, shameless plug, called the Virtual Success Show, where we talk about all this stuff. <laughs> we, Check her out. Yeah, her we out. talk about all this stuff on the podcast. And the only part of the podcast that I do is I show up and I record or I interview people. Then we drop it. I've got a co-host as well. And we drop it in Dropbox. And there is an entire process that we've created that it just shows up everywhere on social media. There's snippets everywhere, the correct links. It's on our website. There's images attached. It's optimized for traffic. But we worked really hard on creating that process and nailing it and then getting our VAs to run it like a well-oiled machine and report back to us properly on results, what they're doing, having oversight over it. And that, you know, means that you can keep your podcast going without doing all the work. How did you come up with this idea? Probably, yeah, that's a good question. Probably through sheer overwhelm. Like one of my, I mean, overwhelm, I still suffer from it. But one of my missions with the virtual hub is to help smaller businesses eradicate the incredible overwhelm that just engulfs you with all the stuff that they're, that all the doing that has to be done in any small business, even medium business. Um And the key, look, the overwhelm will increase if you hire people, be they virtual assistants or other, and you're not set up properly before those people arrive to work in your business. If you just, like I said, throw a body at the problem, you will be even more overwhelmed. So a lot of what we do at the Virtual Hub is help clients to, first of all, get ready, help them to realize there is some work involved in this and then we'll put your person in and help you to do that and get success with it it's a interesting transition going from the financial world to the virtual assistant world like what what how did you start yeah. that like how did you like what sparked it like that is blowing my mind oh yeah 
Yeah. And I mean, look, you know, you would think with my background that I had the, I, I strategized this up. I created a business plan. No, I didn't. This was totally by accident. I mean, this was like the most accidental thing that happened. I left my corporate job. Now, I was an employee in an asset management firm that I was also a shareholder in. So it was kind of an interesting dynamic. And I remain, yeah, I remained a shareholder, but I left as an employee because I wanted to run my own business. I wanted to build my own company. Didn't really know what that looked like, but I had a keen interest in digital marketing, content, all this stuff. So I became a business coach and consultant, which a lot of corporates, when they leave their corporate job, the easiest way to make money quickly is to consult. And I found that I was consulting to small businesses and I could see the roadblock. They all have the same problem, regardless of the industry or the business. They all were overwhelmed and had no time, couldn't afford to hire staff in their own country, um, but just, you know, we're doing everything themselves. You can't grow if you're doing that. You just can't. Um, it's very difficult. So I had read the four hour work week, like everybody else, Tim Ferriss's amazing book. I had gotten myself a VA in the Philippines online and I started recruiting. I started finding VAs online just to help clients out. And before I knew it, I was getting phone calls way more for VAs than I was for business coaching. And one day I was like, I wonder, is there a business in this? So I put on a webinar. I had built a list online at this stage, not huge, maybe two or 3,000 people, had a bit of a following, put on a webinar. I was like, hey, do you want to learn how to do this? And I made an offer at the end and I got 10 buyers. And I was like, boom, we're in business. No website, no name, no concept, nothing. No business plan. That's, that's crazy. Five years later, we have 100 people in the Philippines, <laughs> full offices. I have a company over there. It's like, it's crazy. Yeah. What's your exit strategy on that? Yeah, well, hopefully I can exit with, you know, with a few less wrinkles and gray hair. But it's, it's, it's challenging. But I'll be open. It's a challenging business to be in. I mean, it's, uh, it's very rewarding, but it has taken me probably the guts of four years to learn what I didn't know I didn't know about the Philippines, about running people, HR, all that stuff. I think I would have built it much bigger, much faster had I had more of a plan and had I had more experience in that particular arena of HR management, of people, etc. So it took me a lot. I think it's taken me a long time to get to 100 people. You know, there's, other companies have thousands of people in the Philippines. Um, but our growth now, uh, last year I set up a Philippine company. I made everyone an employee. I got all their benefits sorted out and their healthcare and made it, a, I legitimized the whole thing and we are growing much faster now. So I can see that next year we can double and probably the year after double again. So exit strategy. Um, I've always wanted to build a company that had impact and that could one day be sold, should I ever choose to do that? I'm not sure if I ever will. But you always want to build a company that, that you're going to, that, you know, design it so that it can be sold, even if you never intend to. My goal right now is to get to 500 staff. I'd like to have a, a humming, you know, successful 500 person strong business that has a strong brand globally, but also a strong employee brand in the Philippines where people, the culture is strong, where people want to work there like the Google of the Philippines <laughs> sort of thing. So talk, talk about how you left your job yeah. and, you, and you were setting out to be a consultant and a coach. Like, did were you scared? Like, were you nervous? Like, talk, talk about your emotions when you made that transition, that leap of faith. Yeah, it is an extreme, anyone listening to this who's doing it, thinking about it, has done it, knows it's very challenging. It's, it's your fears it's, it's almost harder leaving corporate with the big salaries and all that because you're leaving a lot behind and the risk of not making the money and, you know, having to pare back your lifestyle is quite, can be debilitating emotionally. And then the other issue I faced was the, you know, the fear of what will, what will people think, you know, what will all my ex corporate buddies think of me working at home and trying to you know, make a crust out there on my own, you know, that, that a lot of those, and even if you're a very strong person, those emotions will take you over. So it's, it's about, um, my biggest tip on how to do this right is to get fully prepared before you do it. And that's not just emotionally, it's financially. So what I did was two things. I did get lucky. So not everyone's going to have this experience, but, oh, mind you, it was five years of planning. I got an opportunity to do that management buyout, to be involved in something in the corporate world first. 
And I saw that as my ticket out. I thought this thing is either going to, I had a feeling it was going to go really well. And I thought, well, you know, it's going to, it's going to kind of cushion me. And I had some income from that after five years, but it was five years of building that. And I learned a lot from being in that kind of half in, half out scenario. But what I think you've got to do, the other thing I did was I pared back my expenses incredibly. Like, I mean, I literally, there was one stage I had no car for like a few years. I, I really pared everything back. I stopped with all the, the lifestyle that goes with corporate. I just stopped all of that. Um, and you absolutely have to do that if you're thinking about leaving and being serious about running your own thing. Because when the money starts to go down, the savings that you've put away or the whatever, it, it, it compounds all the emotion and the feeling of um, not being good enough and all these things that are going to come up for you as a high achiever who was once in corporate. So that, that a lot of that came up for me. So it took you five years to get out. What was what was the day that you decided that you wanted out? Like, was it an, was it an event? Was it the corporate lifestyle? What was it that made you want to be an entrepreneur? Uh, look, I had originally wanted to get out. So the like on the first day of the five year plan. So it wasn't really a five year plan. I did decide. Look, it's a bit different for me because I'm female as well. So I had been on the trading floors for like ten years. Loved it in my twenties. It was just. It was great fun, fast paced, you know, lots of partying, all that sort of jazz. Then I got to about 29 and I could see pretty clearly that this was not sustainable. If you want to have a family, if you even want to meet someone. <laughs> so really not a sustainable life. And I was exhausted by the time I got to kind of 29 and thought I can't keep doing this. Um, so I just started to have a craving for something different. I just... Um, I get bored quickly. I think that's also my nature. So once I do something for kind of five, 10 years, I'm like, okay, I want to do something totally different. Um, and I did, you know, but I had no idea what I was doing. I mean, I, you know, I had no plan. And like I said, I, I, I got a lucky break that I got involved in this management buyout situation. And I remember the opportunity was shown to me and I was like, yep, yeah, I'm in. I just knew that I wanted to learn I, I needed I le had a lot to learn so I, I used that as my kind of springboard mm -hmm. so you didn't know a whole lot about what life your what life was going to look like after you left um, was there anything like as far as resources that you read up on was it or was it just kind of like you know what I'm just gonna go ahead and, and see what happens no I did I did do a lot of planning I mean I started you know the first thing I started doing was uh, I mean, when you're in corporate, you're very shielded from, you know, all the online, like even all these podcasts and everything. I mean, when, when I was in corporate, I wasn't listening to any of this stuff. I wasn't surrounded by people who were doing any of this stuff. So I think the first step really is to start changing your, uh, you know, the podcast you're listening to, the webinars you're attending, and you need to start opening your mind to all this stuff that's going on out there. Read about startups, read about the mistakes, interview people, talk to people. And eventually you start to get a feel for kind of, what's going on out there, you know, I'm, and then, then you start to feel like you're in, you're in the, you're in a, you're in a new space. So that's what I started to do. Mm. Talk about, um, being a mother and being a CEO, like how do you balance that? Yes. I get asked this one a lot. People say, are you completely mental? Like, so I have a four and a half year old business and I have a two and a half year old daughter. So you can imagine. <laughs> There's like... So the trick with this is I, do get times of massive overwhelm, I will be honest. Uh, but I do structure my day. I'm very strict with my time. So I'm very strict that I do, I don't farm my daughter out to daycare five days a week or anything like that. I've got her in daycare three days a week. Um, when she was a baby, it was probably like she was nine months old before I did anything. I just used her sleep times. And you have to become a master delegator. Like you, you have to get the three things you have to get right systems, processes, and team delegation. And if you nail those three things and you're strict with your time, and it's not easy to nail those things, by the way, you've got there's a lot of things that you've got to get right there, but you become the conductor of the orchestra. You're not the person playing all the instruments. So if you're still playing any of the instruments, you need to stop doing that because you need to teach someone else how to play it. And then you've got to be the, the conductor, the leader, and learn to lead. And that is something I didn't know that I was good at until I stepped out of corporate. And I realized that so many things I learned in my corporate career that seemed like second nature to me, other people didn't really know how to do this, particularly in the entrepreneurial world. 
you know, all those like meeting rhythms and agendas and milestones and deadlines and how to run projects and things like that. I was able to actually do that and to lead that sort of thing. And I was, you have to become 100% committed to that. Well, that just goes to show like leadership, right? Like being the conductor of the orchestra, you were forced in, into a, a situation where you had to be that. Do you think people are born with that or can they, is it learned? Yes, they can. Absolutely. It's not, um, most people will not, some people are very good at it, but leadership style is a problem too. And like I, look, I'm good at some parts of it. There's definitely parts of it I need to be, be better at. Um, I think I have a natural bent towards being good at it, but I have managed to teach some of our clients who weren't naturally good at it. There's just some tricks and tools and strategies. And once you nail them and you commit to them from a mindset perspective, so you can't fall into the, this won't work for my business. This doesn't work for me. I always say to clients, well, if that's how you think, then you'll still be in the same situation in 12 months time that you are today. That's just Mm -hmm. how it is. Right. So you either, you either learn to run a, assist, run a business like it's a machine um, or you pedal for the rest of your life. That's just my view, <laughs> to be honest. Um, a, business is, is, a business is a machine, right? Systems run your business. People run your systems. That's kind of how you stop the IP walking out the door as well, that whole problem of people leaving. I, I really love that. Uh, man, I, I don't know why they don't teach us in school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Um so what would you say to Barbara when she's 21? Like what advice would you give her? Yeah, you know, I would give her the advice. Don't obsess so much about what you're going to be. You know, when you leave school, you leave uni, you're like, I want to be a, I always wanted to be like a doctor or a lawyer. I wanted to be, I needed to define what it was I was going to be. And I really struggled with that for a long time because I didn't get into medicine and I didn't, you know, I did really well at school, but I didn't quite make it in there. And what I discovered about myself along the way is I'm a bit of a free spirit that like I like to kind of sometimes you just got to roll with it and you got to learn to see your opportunities because there's opportunity everywhere. And it's better to learn that skill than to pigeonhole yourself too early. How good are you as far as like recognizing the opportunity? Like, is there something that you feel inside of you saying, hey, look, you might want to look at this or take the, you know, take the chance right now. Is there something inside of you or can you just realize it that it's going to happen look i will say it is something i'm very good at uh i don't know whether it's part intuition part deep training of being like anyone who's worked on a trading floor will probably know what i mean i mean when you're in the financial markets money moves so fast like the the thing things change on a dime like other people won't see it and you'll be like i can i can see it changing um and i just i i find it hard to explain to other people how i do that i don't know if i can teach that I just think it's been honed over years of having to do it as a job. Like I literally did it for 10 years. So well, has there ever been like an example of like a, a time where, you know, you just felt like something was guiding you, something was leading you to, to a certain purpose or a certain event and you didn't see it at all. But then when it happened, you're like, oh, that's why this happened. Well, this business is probably the greatest one because I didn't see this one coming. <laughs> you know, had I had I been, I think sometimes when people get really stuck on a business plan or a strategic direction and they don't remain slightly open and slightly fluid, you can't pivot, right? So you have to be able to go, you know what, close that, open this. Like, okay, we're moving out of that, we're moving into this or make, you know, make definitive fast decisions. And I think that's something... I'm naturally good at. Yeah. People have asked me why have I been successful in this particular business? And it is actually, I, I've equated it to being like, I'm still trading. There's still supply demand dynamics. Like for example, we run 24 hour time. We run all time zones. So 24 hour operations in the Philippines, that's three different time zones. We have three different levels of VA and we do part-time and full-time staff. And we have clients coming in with different briefs. We have VAs coming in and doing different things in training. And every day we all come together on a pipeline huddle meeting, the whole team where I've got the trainers and everyone on there. And basically my role on that meeting every day is to match supply and demand. And it's like being a trader. It's the same skills. And I didn't realize that until recently when somebody asked me, why am I successful at this? And I think that's that's it. We always seem to, the trades work out okay. But it's hard. 
<laughs> yeah, well, I think making decisions are always hard. I, I don't know. I, I, I see it, too, in my leadership role where it's hard to get people to make decisions. Uh, and I think the biggest takeaway is just make one. And if it's the wrong one, then we'll go back and we'll look at it and look at your options that you you know had available to yourself. And if there was a better one, we'd look at that and why you didn't choose that. And we can go from there. But I think the biggest problem that people have is that they're just scared to make a decision. They, they're scared. Yeah. Just do something. Just choose to do something. If it's not the right thing, then go back to the drawing board. If it's the wrong choice and see why you made that choice and then try to work on it in the future. I 100% agree because even when you're a trader, right, in the financial markets, you can buy or sell, right? There's only two. You've got to do one. If you sit there and do nothing, you're not in the game. The minute you make a decision, things, then you're in the game, you're in flow, right? So you make a decision, you see what happens, you've got to, you've got to pivot and move and make another decision. The problem, you're right, when people get stuck in indecision or no decision, they are no longer in the game and everyone else is playing. Things are happening around you, but there's nothing really, you're not in it and you need to be in it in order to win it. Yeah. Can you carry that over to your personal life? I do pretty much. Yeah. I don't like, I don't like indecision. I don't like sitting in if there is a situation where I don't make a decision, at this point in my life, I'm now in my 40s, and I finally have accepted that when I don't make a decision, I need to stop thinking about it and allow it to percolate longer in the back of my head without thinking about it. Because there is going to be a reason that it's going to come up later as to why it wasn't. There's a reason intuitively that I'm not making a decision. Could be a better opportunity is coming. Are you scared of making the wrong decision? Uh, yeah, I think we all suffer from that fear. I mean, that, of course, you know, there is the feel the fear and do it anyway kind of thing. There's always fear. Um, but again, it's a skill in my, my career that was honed where I was almost bullied into making fast decisions really quickly and then, and then having to, to switch decision making fast. Yeah. That's crazy. I, I don't know how I, I would work under that, those circumstances of just being, like you said, bullied into making a decision. I guess you just kind of learn though, right? Like yeah. you come in, you come in as a rookie and you don't really, you're, you're so green and you don't really know what's going on. And then you got to make these, you know, second decisions. And it's like, you got people pressuring you like that. Talk about pressure. That is a, that is immense pressure. I don't know how you could do something like that and actually like it. Yeah. I enjoyed it though. And that could be like my personality. I thrive on the sort of, I, I did actually love that. And I loved the dynamic nature of it probably because I get bored quickly. I don't like routine. So I love the, you know, I used to go to work every day and not have any idea what's going to happen. But again, I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to work in a hospital. I always want my original plan was I want to be a doctor in a hospital where it's crazy and like in the ER and all that. So obviously my personality was drawn to that sort of fast environment, I guess. I like that. Yeah, I'm kind of the same way. Not so much of um, uh, making quick decisions all the time, but I, I definitely like that fast pace. I think I'm like you. I get bored uh, sitting still for, a, you know, a, a long period of time. But you said you are you are the type of person that is a free spirit. You know, you're you're from your your profile says you're from Australia, but you have an Irish accent. How how did how did you end up down under? Yes. So again, in my corporate career, you'll actually laugh at this. So I was going great. I had this corporate career. I was 24. Technically, the time in your life when you don't want to be, you know, making massive changes, you want to go on that career path, right? And I was like you know what, I'm kind of sick of this. I want to go to Australia for a year and go backpacking. And my boss at the time was like, you're making the biggest mistake of your career. You're this, you're that. And I was like, yeah, 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 no, maybe. I don't know. I'm going anyway. So I just am a bit like that. I kind of got bored of the, and I fully believed nobody could tell me that I couldn't take a year off and come back and just pick up where I left off with another firm. Now, maybe that was just a bit of, you know, I don't know, is that egotistical? Is that what? I just felt like, well, I'll just deal with that when I come back. And I did. And, you know, so I went to Australia as a backpacker, absolutely loved it here. Went back to Dublin after a year, got back in the career and everything took off, actually took off even better than it was before. Um, but I couldn't let go of Australia. I was like, wow, I just loved that lifestyle. So I literally left again and was like, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm just going to go to Australia on a holiday visa and I'm going to use all my contacts in London and all the investment banks. And I'm going to tell them, you've got to introduce me to people in Sydney, in the investment banks here, because I'm going down there and I'm going to get a job. And I did. <laughs> I did. I worked at UBS for about a few months and had a 10 year career here. <laughs> wow. So. Talk about like just 
picking up and going and just living your life. Like that is an example of that. Like I think so many people uh, live this life of comfort. Like they never leave, you know, here in the States, they never leave where they come from because they're scared of the outside bubble that they'll get into. And that, that uncomfortableness of just that, I don't know, the uneasiness of change. And like, I, I was like, I, I used to be like that. Like I, I, uh, I'm from a small town in Delaware. And, um, when I came to the city, it was kind of like, wow, like it was kind of a wake up call. It was kind of like, you know, I love this, but I didn't realize that until I got there. Uh, I went backpacking in Bangkok and Thailand yeah, for a month yeah. in college. And it was phenomenal. Even though I was like that small town, like country guy, like, uh, haven't really flown anywhere and then end up going 24 hours on a plane to Bangkok and then hanging out with some buddies for a month going two two weeks in um, Bangkok and then two weeks south of Thailand it was yeah. was I grew up so quick like it was just phenomenal and like that sparked like something inside of me to like really chase and pursue my dreams and I think what you're doing now is 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 just that like you're pursuing your dreams you're pursuing yeah. you're, you've created something right you, you stepped outside of your comfort zone you left the corporate world you created this well it wasn't what you started at first you wanted to go to like the coaching and, and that side of things but it evolved into this it's something you can teach your kids as well like travel is the most travel is such an important thing to to for your children and to teach your children and to let them go because they will learn this early in life that, you know, that, that you can spread your wings and you can see how different cultures do things and things will keep moving, you know, things will, stuff will happen. Yeah. It's a great lesson for, it's a great lesson for everybody because it's like, even though you might take that leap of faith towards something, things could change and you might find something else that you're better at. Um, not saying you're not a good coach or yeah. speaker or anything like that. You're phenomenal. I'm I was sure a you're horrible phenomenal, coach. I'll but... be honest with you. I also hated it. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually am so glad. I have no patience. You know, like I, I just think I'm a good coach to a point. And then when people don't take action, I'm like, oh, come on. <laughs> like, I just, I just can't bear it. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. Oh, about a year and a half. Yeah, yeah. Oh, look, some of the, I'm, you know, some of the people I coached would say I was a great coach. But I got to the point where I was like, look, if you don't do what I'm, t I got to the point where I was saying to people, if you do everything I tell you to do, right, you will be successful. But if you start fumbling around and messing and not doing it and taking action, you, you'll, you'll end up in the same position that you are today in 12 months time. And I became a little bit too that's quite an aggressive line to take with people who are <laughs> trying to be coached. But I I realized through coaching that I actually want to build a company. I don't really want to coach other people to build theirs. That's mm, the truth. That's powerful. Yeah. That's powerful. Mm. Do you ever get to go to the Philippines to visit your employees there? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I do. I was just there in September. Yeah. I mean, it's an awesome spot. I don't get to go for long. That's the problem because I have a two year old. So I kind of fly over, fly back and I'm like working 24 hours when I'm there, but it is. a huge how, how long is that flight? Eight hours from yeah, but it's a beautiful location, like the most beautiful beaches in the world and everything are in, are in the Philippines. I want to respect your time. How can people connect with you? Sure. So the quickest way, if you want to connect with me personally, LinkedIn is kind of where I connect with people. I share some content and stuff over there. Um, if you want to know more about the Virtual Hub, uh, you can go to the virtualhub.com. Um, and connect with you can book a free strategy call actually with one of our consultants there you don't get to talk to me because like i said i'm a terrible coach so <laughs> i don't i don't talk. the only time people get to talk to me is through these podcasts because i'm too busy trying to run the ship <laughs> that is awesome and what's your podcast go ahead and plug that again sure it's the virtual success show and that is on itunes it's also under the content section on our website thevirtualhub.com uh, we've got the podcast there. We also have lots of guides. So, you know, we've got like um, over on the, the website, we've got a ton of guides about like how to secure your business before a VA, what questions to ask in interviews, tons of content over there to help you guys with outsourcing and VAs and all that stuff. What episode are you guys on? We're on, oh, you know what? I should know that off the top of my head. I don't know. I think it's about 55 or something. But we've even, we do shows like, for example, 
we have a show. When is it time to fire your VA? Like, it's like the, literally the questions that we get asked. So it's very tactical. That's great, though. It's not just waffle. Very tactical I've been, show. I've been yeah. thinking about Shit. getting a VA for a, a long time. What is the like the average cost? Yeah. So obviously, if you go direct, you can obviously get cheaper VAs. So you, you know, you can go direct to market and get them on Upwork and all these places if you have time for that. <laughs> For us, the <laughs> cost, we do multi-currency pricing. We have we operate in all time zones. So for the U.S. market, for example, our pricing is from 8 U.S. an hour up to 12 U.S. an hour. But we do a minimum of 20 hours a week. We're more like a dedicated staff kind of place. We don't do like two and three hours and stuff like that. Yeah. Barbara, real quick, at the end of my shows, I always try to have the guest um, kind of give me like a kind of like a pep talk so i'll give you a scenario like let's say i am a a uh, an employee in a corporate sure. setting and i want to go out on my own and create and build my own corporation uh, i have reservations i don't really know what i'm doing but i know that my heart isn't in my in my work what would your advice be to them as far as going out and achieving their goal okay so the first step definitely before you even think about a business plan or anything is to take a look at your own personal financial situation and you take a knife, you, this is where you've got to like do some financial planning. You start to look at your the way you live, where you spend money, and the way you live, the way you spend money, and where you spend money. And you have to ask yourself, what am I willing to slice to take a knife to in terms of my expenses in order to make this dream of mine happen? And that's where you will find that you'll come up against a lot of emotional barriers around, oh, my friends all like to eat at this amazing five-star restaurant in blah, 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 because you won't be doing that anymore. So you've got to like, you've got to be realistic. There will be a few years where it'll be quite tight. And you've got to ask yourself, like, am I willing to take the pain? And if the answer to that question is, hell yeah, I don't even care. Then you take the next step is we, then you've got to figure out what uh, I, I would Look at your expertise and, and don't discount what you've learned in the corporate world, because I did. And I didn't think that I had learned anything particularly useful. It turned out that I had a lot of skills that I didn't realize I had. Um, and consulting is the fastest way to earn money quickly, but it also is the fastest way to figure out what is the problem that my great business is going to solve that people will pay money for today. And the only way to get the true answer to that is to go and consult for a little while. Now, that's if you're doing, like, you may end up in an e-commerce business. You may end up in, I don't know, selling scooters online or something. But even um, even with something like that, unless you've got a background in that, just be careful, like, launching into something massive like that because you, um, you know, you, you might, there's a lot of things you don't know you don't know. Oh, and the, uh, my, fi my final tip, all the social media that you see about all these guys doing seven, seven figure funnels and eight figure this and blah, blah, blah. Nothing is easy. The, it is, it is hard work. Um, in the beginning, it will pay off, but you've got to just focus your attention really heavily on your customer or client and solving whatever it is that is their pain point. Beautiful. I love that. What, why do you think people quit? Like what you see these guys on YouTube or Instagram and they're creating these videos and they're not getting the results they want. It's like, is it a generational thing or is it like, they're just, I don't know. Are they just not seeing the results that they want? Yeah. Look, I, I think it's a bit of an emotional roller coaster, Like we talked about. I mean, my first, you know, thing after the corporate world, I was consulting coaching, but I also had a platform called a website called energize wealth, which was all about, I had this vision of, um, inspiring more women to be into the money game, right? Because I found it quite an exciting game. So I had this whole feminine, I wanted to make a website that was like a Vogue magazine, but had all these very meaty topics. And I had, I did an online TV show called Feminine Wealth TV. I did loads of things, right? I did it all. I even did this massive product launch that kind of flopped. And the problem was that I didn't know this at the time. I was probably at a tipping point. But I was so exhausted by the product launch and by the whole failure of it and then the emotional thing of what will people think that I just kind of disappeared off the scene for about four months and couldn't, I just couldn't handle it. And I did more coaching. And then out of the ashes of that, that's where the virtual hub came from. So yeah. maybe it was a good thing, but I think sometimes um, we just give up because we, we run out of energy and you don't realize that you're at, you, you might be at the tipping point. Mm. 
but you might be a year away from the tipping point as well. You don't know. You just don't know. You can't, you don't know unless you keep going, right? You keep going. You got to keep going. Well, you got to keep shifting and changing too, though, because if you keep going persistent, like people say, you have to be persistent. I'm like, well, if you're persistently going after the wrong thing that's not working, well, you're just going to tire yourself out. You need to really, um, do you know, I heard Eben Pagan once say, he's like one of those big marketers. He said something that was pivotal for me. He said, with marketing, stop expecting it to work because 99% of the time it won't work. And you've got, your job as a marketer is to keep testing and trying and measuring and testing new things to find the thing. And when you've hit on the thing that works, it will explode. But because we keep expecting all these webinars to work and funnels and online, whatever, you know, we, we get a bit, um, I know I became kind of down about the fact that I wasn't, it wasn't working for me. Uh, but it won't work. Most of it won't work. What's your favorite quote? Inspirational quote. Feel the fear and do it anyway. Because my mother, Ooh. yeah, my mother, I think I was lucky. I mean, I, was, I had very strong parents, but my mom used to say that to me as a child all the time. You can be anything you want to be. Just feel the fear and do it anyway. So maybe that's why I am the way I am. What What book has inspired you to become the entrepreneur that you are today? Oh, I have to remember the name of it. Isn't that terrible? Um, you know that one? I think it's called um is it uh built to sell i think it's called built to sell i should know the name i know the content but it was a pivotal book for me where i really i mean there's a few of them there's there's the e-myth by michael gerber i mean that you know i kind of knew that stuff but when i read the book it really it really cemented what i intuitively already knew that a business is a machine systems run your business don't get caught up in the whole people thing you need people but you need to build a build a machine and that that cemented that thinking for me and then the next one i think it's um one of those rockefeller books uh gee i'll have to come back to you on that built to sell built to sell creating a business that can thrive without you does that sound familiar yes by john yeah, and what... i cannot pronounce his last name Oh, yeah, that's a great book. Yeah, that's a storybook, actually. It's like a story about this guy in New York who has this advertising agency. And one of his friends is a billionaire, and he helps him to build a machine, basically. So that kind of cemented again. How often do you read? Not, not as often as I'd like. I used to be a, a huge reader. These days, I listen to podcasts a lot because, well, you know, I'm out walking with my daughter. I'm, I'm being a mom most of the time. You can't really read a book when you're <laughs> the nighttime. It's like, read a book. Oh, my God. <laughs> Barbara, thank you so much for joining the show today. Uh, it has been an honor to have you on my show. I, I cannot wait to check in with you in the future and see uh, how much of the VA world you're tearing it up. Thank you for having me. I want to say thank you to Barbara for coming on the show today and hanging out and giving us a ton of valuable content and great advice. Learn from her experience and take it all in. If you would like to follow me on Instagram, you can follow me at tdowns80 on Twitter at Downs Trey. Hit me up on Facebook at Trey Downs, D-O-W-N-E-S. Hit me up over there and see some of the behind-the-scenes activities that I am currently doing. You can also check out my YouTube channel. I think it's Trey Downs. I can't remember. It's I've been putting some uh, some content up there recently. And I cannot remember. I think it's, yeah, check me out, Trey Downs over there. I'm doing some Your Superior Self rants, uh, getting into that platform a little bit. And also, if you're in the Canton area, I am trying to start a co working space over there. I'm building the community currently. It's going to be a community that is supportive about your success and supportive about your needs to achieve that success. So, it's like a brick and mortar mastermind, I guess. I'm building the, the uh, community as we speak and our next meetup is going to be February 24th at 12 p.m. If you want more information on our co-working space in Baltimore, hit me up at tradedowns, D-O-W-N-E-S, at superiorself.net. Email me your thoughts, your concerns. Let me know if you're interested. Um, we are building the community early and we want to get people that are like-minded about success and uh, community driven uh, to apply so if you guys want to hang out you can come check us out on the 24th it's going to be at small Tomorrow. email me or you can check us out on meetup we have a uh, place over there 
it's going to be under Blend Baltimore. I'm super excited to start that journey in my life, and I hope to see you guys over there. Check me out, hit me up, whatever you want to do. I'm here for you guys, and I will talk to you guys later.